And now I would like to turn this over to the very talented and lovely Stephanie Duttenhaver. Well, hi everyone. This is my favorite night. Trinity Church is where it all began, and I love it here. I want to thank Robin. I want to join Robin, actually, in thanking all the volunteers who've made this festival possible. But I would be remiss if I did not thank Robin for the wonderful job that she's done. <laughs> putting, toge a, putting together a five-day festival with one staff member is a monumental job. Her energy, her work ethic, her calm demeanor is the glue all of us together throughout the year. Do we have problems? <laughs> Is it working? Okay. Um, all the board members and the volunteers possess tremendous admiration for Robin, and we want to thank you for your great work, Robin. Thank you. Well, it's really, really wonderful to see all of these happy and excited faces tonight, including Bob and Alice Jepson for sitting here in the front row. They are tonight's keynote sponsors, and we want to thank you so much for sponsoring this event tonight. <laughs> Most of you know that Allison is on our board, and she's jumped right in and taken many responsibilities already, including an event that we have in May, where we have Pulitzer Prize winning author Geraldine Brooks um, coming to the festival. I'd also like to thank the City of Savannah and the Department of Cultural Affairs and contract coordinator Michelle Hunter for her support, helping us through all of our growing pains. We'd also like to recognize and thank Enoch Hendry and Ann Curry, and um, thank you for their gift to this elegant and beautiful sanctuary. And finally, we'd like to thank the Telfair Museum, who, like Trinity Church, has partnered with for the very first year and given us venues that must be the most beautiful settings that anyone could hope for, so thank you. As I look around, I can see that we're all feeling the same pleasant anticipation. It's an expectancy that's built up over the past five years because for these long, long years, we have hoped to host Pat Conroy at the Savannah Book Festival. And now we are delighted to finally welcome Pat as our honored guest. What better way to celebrate our fifth year of the festival than with the Low Country's most celebrated storyteller? He has entertained us with his books for more than 40 years. In the canon of Southern writers, there's Faulkner, Wolf, O'Connor, and Conroy. He is truly gracious, engaging, and genteel, and he's the poet laureate of the South. Please join me in finally welcoming Pat Conroy. on the baseball team at the Citadel has two books out and we'll be signing those after we talk tomorrow. Stand up and say hi. The world. I have long roots in Savannah, Georgia. I was brought here in 1961 by my English teacher, Jean Norris who I've written about over again, and I'll write about a thousand more times before I die. But he brought me here. He took me on a tour of homes. My chemistry teacher, Walt Ganan, lived across from Jim Williams in that beautiful square with the synagogue in Gothic architecture. I've always loved that synagogue. Gene took me to the Crystal Beer Park, <laughs> where two waiters 
Monroe and Smitty taught me what waiters were supposed to act like and be like and how a great waiter could make a meal a thing of pleasure and magnificent forever. Later, I received the second honorary doctorate given out by the Savannah College of Art and Design, where my oldest daughter is a graduate. Our relationship deteriorated the next year. I was on the board when they sued me for $108 million. <laughs> And it fractured a very beloved relationship <laughs> for me. But I know Savannah, I know it in my bones. I regret that John Barrett got here before I did. <laughs> and I am as sorry about that as I can be. Now, let me tell you about me and my career. When I speak at book festivals, I always love talking about how I started out and the family I come from. And I know Savannah is an aristocratic town, and I can look around and see a lot of you are aristocrats. <laughs> Let me tell you about my family. Is my family, here were their names. I just like giving out mom's family names. There was Clyde, Talitha, Vashti, Pluma, and my favorite name was we used to go around cleaning graves once a year. And I'd go and I was with my grandmother one time, we were cleaning this grave, and I said, Stanny, uh, who's this guy named after? And the name on the gravestone was Jeremiah Meyer Peak. Thanks. <laughs> How you doing? <laughs> <laughs> Is that better? Jerry Meyer Peak. And I said, who's he named after, Stanny? And she says he was named after the prophet, Jerry Meyer. <laughs> now, my mother um, was a cute little um, Atlanta girl. And my father was down for World War II being trained in Atlanta, the Atlanta Naval Air Station. And he said he went down, he was a Chicago Irishman, tough, mean-spirited, frothing at the mouth, angry at the world. And he said, now son, he told his family this, now, I was downtown, and I asked a barber where I could go in Atlanta to hunt broads. <laughs> And the guy said, go to Peachtree Street. So he went to Peachtree Street and walking out of Davison's department store, my poor little mother, 17. And mom runs out and then this massive Marine chases her down, she's with her two sisters. And dad was his suave big city ways. He said, you know, I was gonna put some big city moves on her because I knew she's a Southern girl. And she'd never seen these before. So he put some big moves on mom, and he said, now, you wanna go out? Um, you know, I'm going to war, I'll probably be dead in a month. <laughs> and if you don't mind going out, you know, we can go out, we can you know, go to a movie, have dinner, make out a little bit. So my mother has never seen anything like this in her life. Oops. <laughs> They can't hear you? No. Oh, they can't hear me outside. <laughs> okay, thanks. <laughs> if you can't hear me outside, I'll talk loud. <laughs> so, Dad is saying all this, a bus comes out. <laughs> Hi. I, I'll be, no, I can't. My best friends before this evening ends are gonna be the people working the microphone. <laughs> Can y'all go to dinner after this? <laughs> so my mother gets in the bus with her sisters and it's summertime, it's hot, 
They didn't have air conditioning back then. So dad is singing, his mom runs back and sits down by the window. Dad is there saying, please give me your phone number, your address, anything, any way I can get in touch with you. And mom, you know, she was well-raised, a little southern girl, and she wasn't gonna do that. And so the bus starts pulling away. My father, who's a splendid athlete, starts racing beside the bus. Please, anything, give me something. You gotta give me something. We'll just go out, we'll have some fun. And the bus is pulling off, and my mother's head pops out the window and says, Rosedale 3, 6928. <laughs> my sister would hear this story and say, Tell him the wrong number, Mom. <laughs> Just one digit, and none of this happens. <laughs> none of your kids would be insane like all of us are now. Now, Dad, now when the seven children and six miscarriages uh, in my Roman Catholic family, I, I just found out in a new book I'm writing, my mother handled snakes as a child in a primitive Baptist church in Piedmont, Alabama. And this surprised me. But she converted to Roman Catholicism she and dad had seven children, six miscarriages, and my sister miscarriages, the lucky ones. <laughs> and Carol thought these poor little doomed Conroy fetuses were listening to what was going on around them and decided just to merely kill themselves <laughs> in embryo not wanting to enjoy this. Now, Dad, here's what I love about Dad. Because Dad thought that he was like an expert catlet and all that, um, he thought they were crazy. And he thought they were hick names, hillbilly names. So he named all his seven children. Here we are. Pat, Carol, Mike, <laughs> Kathy, Jim, Tim, Tom. <laughs> and with that list, you know everything you need to know, everything about the creativity of the Irish in America. <laughs> now, when I was at the Citadel with John, and by the time I got to the Citadel, I knew I wanted I had great English teachers in high school. They fired me up, made me glory in the language, fed me books, and I read those books. I was on fire for reading. I couldn't help it. The language excited me. The language inspired me. The language did things to me that nothing else did. So I went to the Citadel, not exactly a breeding ground of novelists, in the American South. <laughs> but I went there and I thought, when, it, you know, when I was going through it, you know, I may not like this much, which I didn't, <laughs> but it sure is interesting. It's sure I'm getting a glimpse of the world I did not know exists and did not want to exist. <laughs> oh, hey. <laughs> I haven't seen you all yet, how are you doing? <laughs> And so I wrote, like I was going. My first book was about a Savannah native who went to Benedictine. His nickname at the Citadel was the Boo. He was Colonel Thomas Nugent Kovazi. And I was terrified of him when I was at the Citadel. But he also, you came to love this guy. He was one of these guys that you think you would follow into any battle ever fought. If he told you to do something, you would do it. And you would like doing it because he asked you to. You would do it the best you could. He was one of those military men that I've come across that I have loved. So, when I graduated from the Citadel, was teaching at Buford High School, 
I met the Buddha, my friend. And I met him, and he came out of the back door where he lived. I said, Colonel, how you doing? And he said, not so good, Bubba. And I said, tell me why. He said, they fired me, Bubba. They said I was bad for discipline. I said, you? Bad for discipline? I was scared to death of you. He said, that's what they said. And I said, Colonel, I know you don't know this, but I want to be a writer. What if I tell your story? Well, I did. I started going, I still can't type, by the way. I still write everything by hand. I'm about 19 inventions behind. <laughs> and I still write like Milton did. <laughs> and so I started writing, going to interviewing the boo every weekend. And a year later, we had a book. Now, how to publish a book? Do you all know how to do it? It's easier than that. But back then, 1969, we looked for a publisher. And I had heard every general in the United States talk to me at the Citadel. I had never heard a writer talk to me at the Citadel. And I had no idea what to do. I didn't know a writer. Um, I, as far as I know, they didn't have festivals like this back then. And certainly, I wouldn't have been invited to one. But what I did is, the boo was smoking, he always smoked these cigars, lying in his bathrobe, reading through yearbooks, remembering stories. And he was doing this on one occasion we'd finished. And he said, Baba, you were an English major. Let me give you the translation of that. At the Citadel, if you majored in English, it was an open game. What? Okay, it was an open admission that you were gay. <laughs> Need anybody else to repeat it? <laughs> so he said, you're an English major, Bubba. When you were down there in the English department, um, in the bathroom, changing into your panties, your brassiers, did you ever talk about publishing a book? I said, Colonel, I know nothing about publishing a book at all. And he thought a moment, and then he said, let's look into yellow pages. <laughs> so we did. And I looked up R.L. Bryan Company, and it said, invitations, business cards, birthday cards, books. <laughs> so I dressed up in a suit and tie the next day, and I went down, and I, um, I've written a book that I'd like you to publish. And the vice president said, you've come to the right place, son. <laughs> and I said, what do I have to do to get it published? He said, well, you bring me a check for $2,500, that's 500 bucks. If you bring me a check for $3,000, we add another couple hundred on, and that's how we work. We have it all worked out. And I said, is that how books get published? He said, son, do you think we do it for free? <laughs> so I went down to People's Bank in Beaufort, South Carolina. And Willie Shepper was my banker, and he was a Citadel grad. So I went and I said, Willie, I need to borrow $2,500. I've written the book about the Citadel. Willie said, what? No one's ever written a book about the Citadel. I'll give you 4000 So I completed this hard-nosed negotiation. <laughs> and a year later, in the same week, we had my trial 
trying to get my job at Tefusky Island back. The week they had that trial, my daughter, you know, the mother gave me a party, along with a boo in Buford. And it sold out of the 1,500 original copies that sold out almost before the book was published. I learned something. Have a subject somebody wants to read about. <laughs> <clears throat> And if this city does not know that, after John Barrett's book, <laughs> no city on earth could know it better. And it is, uh, and I'm trying to get John to adopt me <laughs> as I enter into my late 60s to comfort me in my old age with the leftover money he has made. Well, I think, okay, I would ride around with, um, okay. so angry what happened to me, those wonderful kids that I met out there in that schoolhouse, those sweetheart children, they were wonderful. And I wrote this book, and I mean, it flowed like lava out of me. I was as mad as I've ever been. So finally I finished that book. But a reporter had come through Buford of the News of My Fire, had interviewed me. And when he saw my pathetic little book, The Boo, he said, Pat, do you have an agent? And I said, no, I'm not an actor. <laughs> and he said, let me give you the name of the guy. And he gave the name of his agent, which was Julian Bach of New York City. Now, doesn't he sound like his mother knew he was going to be an agent? I said, Julian Bach? And so, I, I was terrified of public speaking, that kind of stuff, at that time of my life. Um, but I never needed as many microphones as I've needed tonight. <laughs> I, so, I wrote out, I was so afraid about calling him. And, you know, he sounded so big time to me, and, you know. I was small time, and I knew it. So I wrote down everything I was going to say. Hello, Mr. Bach. My name is Pat Conroy, and I'm from Beaufort, South Carolina. And I have written a book I think will interest you very much. Okay, I get Julian on the phone. And he said, you are who? He said, son. I've barely heard of South Carolina. I've never heard of Buford in my life. And I don't plan to. Well, I said I'm going to fire my secretary for letting you through. 
And I said, I told her I'm your first cousin. <laughs> and then my mother had died. <laughs> he says, I've never heard such ridiculous stuff. He said, look, I want to tell you something. I want to be honest with you. I get calls from losers like you every day of my life. Every single day. And I don't want you to call me or get in touch with me again. Bam. I write him a letter. <laughs> Dear Mr. Julian Bach, whatever goodness or kindness was in a heart when you were born has been drummed out completely in the canyons of New York City. And I have rarely met a ruder, more horrifying, more dreadful excuse for a human being than you in my entire life. And if this just happens to you in New York City, have a glass, have a ball, and good luck in your miserable, execrable life as you will live it. He liked the letter. <laughs> And he, he told me this, and he writes me back, and in fact, I called after this, and, uh, and he said, I'll read it, and he's still stern, he said, look, get your little book up here, I promise I'll read it on the weekend read, and I'll tell you what I think about it, and I'll tell you honestly, if it's junk, I'm sending it back to you. Here's the problem. Ladies and gentlemen, a huge problem for me. I told you I didn't type. So I've got a manuscript handwritten for 250 pages. <laughs> so in my absolute horror, I turned to my wife and my mother and said, what do I do? He wants it this weekend. Every woman in Buford <laughs> who still talked to me, and it wasn't men, <laughs> and tight, came to the front and back doors, and Mom and Barbara would hand them a chapter here, a chapter there, chapter here, chapter there, and when do you have to have it back? And he said, Mom, Barbara would say, tomorrow. We've got to have it for the weekend reads. For these wonderful women, they went home. Okay, the problem arose because I don't type. They did it in lined yellow paper, <laughs> onion skin paper, <laughs> blue paper, <laughs> pica, elite. <laughs> that little stuff that looks like handwriting. And Harriet Kaiserling's, her personal stationery, <laughs> with Harriet's name and address. I race it up to the post office. It's, it's 6.05 and I get there, they've kept the post office open for me. That's the kind of town of youth it was in those days. And they kept it open, we got it off. And it got to Julian for the weekend read. When he got it, unboxed it, he calls me up. And he said, Pat, I have not read a single word of it, but it's the cutest thing I've ever seen. It took me a long time to be able to tell this story. <laughs> a long time. It's, um, but Julian then wrote me a letter. He says, Pat, um, you're very lucky. 
you're natural born writer, and you don't know it yet. But I know it. The agents in my office know it. We all agree. You can write lots of books, and what you don't know is you're going to be turned into movies, and plays, and television, and you can have a fruitful career, because I can smell a novel somewhere in you. And it was a letter that I have a, um, in my house, hanging from a wall today. Did I stay with Julian Bach? I gave his eulogy last year when he died at 94. And he said, Pat, you and I have been loyal to each other. I said, thanks for taking that phone call, Julian. <laughs> and even though Julian was dying, he said, Pat, thanks for making it. And it turned out to be a wonderful, fruitful relationship. Now, the next phone call from Julian was not as pleasant. <laughs> he calls me, he calls me in Buford one day. He says, Pat, I have great news. Houghton Mifflin wants to publish your book. They're the publishers of Henry James, Emily Dickinson, Edith Wharton, Thoreau, and here's even the better news. They want to do it for $7,500. And in a line he never let me forget in my entire life, Julian Bach, I said to Julian Bach, Julian, I could get it done a lot cheaper down here. <laughs> And, uh, and he said, Pat, my God, here's what South Carolina must be pathetic. And he said, you do understand that it is they who pay you. John and I had lunch with my best friend from high school. John's my best friend from college. A guy named Bernie Shine. And Bernie was one of the ones who let me know of the perils of fame. And it's always, you know, because I did something to Bernie that y'all will not like me for, but I did it. You know? And I, I have to fess up. And the, the story will end with a very famous movie star at the end of it. But first, I got to tell you a little bit about Bernie. Okay, Bernie is um, John. And I issued Bernie provisos. You would never want Bernie speaking where I am speaking right now, <laughs> and you would be killing the microphone instead of broadcasting it. He, Bernie, is the most profane man <laughs> I have ever met. But he's also, I was teaching um, at Buford High School. He was the principal of Port Royal Elementary School. And Bernie asked me a favor one day. He said, Pat, I've never known if I was really smart or not. And could you just get me my permanent record that was in the vault at Buford High School and bring it over to that party tonight? I'd like to see what my IQ is. And so I went in to get it, and right at the end of school, Got the IQ. Out of curiosity, I looked up Bernie's IQ, which is 135, perfectly acceptable. And, and I had an idea. <laughs> <clears throat> and I had to fill out my own students, my homeroom students, IQs and you know, their test scores and all that stuff. So I looked up the old IQ thing, and I selected a new IQ to put in Bernie's folder. And I've always tried to remember which one I put, but I believe it was 69. <laughs> <laughs> so 
So I take this to the party. And Bernie's excited about it. Everybody at the, the party knew about it. They knew it was a trip that we planned. <clears throat> so as I go in, I threw it to Bernie, who was sitting on the couch. And he starts going through it, but he gets bogged down, the librarian. We had this just blistering librarian who terrified us. She hated it when we took out a book. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and she hated Bernie Shine more than anybody could possibly merit hating. And she wrote letters trying to get kicked out of school. Bernie started reading those. And he got his, his mind off the thing. And he's muttering stuff like, I'll go over and burn her house down. <laughs> They'll never be able to trace it to these letters. <laughs> and so Bernie goes to the, finally he goes to the IQ. He remembers why he's in this thing. And he goes to the IQ. And I think we were all dancing. You know, there's, uh, and everybody's like tense over, looking and waiting. And Bernie gets this shocked look on his face. And he's got a very mobile face. <laughs> he's got this look. And what my friend George Garvey from Ridgeland said, Bernie boy, what's wrong with you? You look like you've seen a ghost, boy. Bernie looks up and says, I'm an idiot. But then he tries to put, put a good spin on it. But then he says, I've got the lowest IQ of anyone who ever graduated from a four-year college. <laughs> this so alarmed Bernie, he applied for Harvard as a school of education that year. And George Garvey said, now tell him you're an idiot, Bernie, to be honest. <laughs> And Bernie got in. <laughs> and it changed his life. Here's what the mistake I made. I felt bad about this one. I forgot to tell Bernie <laughs> what I had done until five years later. <laughs> and Bernie went up, got his degree at Harvard, and then majored got his master's and wrote his thesis on why an IQ has nothing to do with human intelligence. <laughs> and he also helped my life. And you know, I was still in Buford, and Bernie you know, went to get his master's degree, and he called up one day. He said, Pat, I've been all over this campus. I've talked to everybody, med school, law school, business school. I've talked to them all. And here's what I gotta tell you. You're not gonna believe it. And I said, what is it, Bernie? He said, we're smarter than these people. <laughs> and I said, come on, Bernie, give me a break. He said, no, no, we're smarter. And we got a lot better personalities. <laughs> I don't see how these boys get dates. This is it. Well, Bernie finds out five years later. And then he vows revenge. Okay? And I take Bernie seriously when he vows revenge. The Great Santini came out in 1976. It sold about 300 copies, and that includes intergalactic sales. <laughs> he, the book comes out, you know, I'm disappointed with how it does, but it's okay, you know, at the beginning of my career still. I get a letter from Jimmy Carter in the White House. So, you know, I read this letter on a White House stationery, looked like Jimmy's signature. He say, dear Mr. Conway, Rose and I have been reading sections of your book to each other before we go to sleep at night. 
not since I read Herman Melville at the U.S. Naval Academy have I been so moved by the power of such work. Please call the White House. We want you to come for dinner, uh, to be our special guest. So, I'm going da 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 da. <laughs> I'll probably be named the Ambassador of St. James. That was a new career for me. Finally, I'm being recognized. <laughs> I call the White House. <laughs> After waiting about a half hour, a member of the Secret Service came <laughs> to find out about my fixation with the President and how I got a letter he never had written. And he had never heard of me, didn't want to hear of me, and I was never to call the president again. <laughs> so I told the party, another party that went, Atlanta, I said, well, it's strange, these things happen. So Bernie's over here, and he said, <laughs> Bernie comes and he says, he hears me telling the story, he says, hey, Pat, what an egomaniac you've become. Why would the President of the United States, he was trying to do things like nuclear weapons treaties, waste his time reading a book by you that no one else in America has read? <laughs> I said, Bernie, I've got it, I've got it, I understand it. 1980, the Lord of Discipline came back. It's still not, you know, not a big stir, but, you know, nice. Nice sales. The letter arrives from Wildwood Studio with Robert Redford's signature on it. Dear Pat, <laughs> not since I was at the University of Colorado and read The Young Hemingway have I been as moved. <laughs> I call while in the studio thinking, my God, I'll get the cast off. It'll be terrific. Actresses, it'll be great. I call while in the studio, and you know what happened. They'd never heard of me. Robert Redford had never heard of me. Didn't want to hear from me. And they were going to call the Beverly Hills cops to make sure I didn't, wasn't a danger or a threat. Okay, I'm traveling around, Prince of Tides tonight. And suddenly, it changed. And you know, I turned into this godlike figure who stands before you tonight. <laughs> and actual human beings were showing up at my signings. It was great. And I loved it. Okay, I'm traveling from city to city. I get to Portland, Oregon when I get a message, when I go back to the hotel. Please call Barbara Streisand. <laughs> and I said, hey Bernie, <laughs> I ain't got no 69 IQ. <laughs> wow. In the next place, Please call Barbara Streisand. Ah, uh, Bernie. You never give up. So I throw away about nine, call Barbara Streisand. And I'm in Chicago, and I hear a voice, angry voice. Why haven't you been answering my phone calls? This is Barbara Streisand. Everybody answers my phone calls. I said, not bad, Bernie. <laughs> I didn't know you could talk like a girl. But then I heard a little too much Brooklyn and not enough of the South. And I said, are you really Barbara Streisand? Who the hell do you think I am? 
what are you doing? And <laughs> so I said, sing the first line, people. <laughs> there was a long pause. <laughs> and then I hear, And I said, Miss Tricem, <laughs> I must beg your forgiveness and simply beg it. And uh, I need to tell you about my friend Bernie Shine. <laughs> anyway, I hope the people outside could hear. This is, <laughs> and if, if they can't, it's not because we didn't try changing microphones. <laughs> Sir, where do you want to go to dinner? <laughs> Here's why I love things like this. I love the gathering, the in gathering of people who love to read. I think we're, we're not a vanishing breed at all. I've been, uh, this Kindle has been interesting to me. I used to go down to the beach of Ship Island see what people were reading in the summers. Now I can't find out. <laughs> They're all reading Kindles. And it is, uh, it's, it's just sort of amazing to me. Um, I never thought I would see America, all of America, everywhere they go, looking at their hand. <laughs> and the thing you do with your hand, I think it's Twitter, I think it's called that. And everybody, I see everybody, but I'm in an airplane. Everybody, I'm the only person looking at people. <laughs> and everybody else is looking at their other hand. And it's been interesting to me wondering how it's going to affect writing, and I don't think we know yet. You know, I don't know if the book is in trouble. It seems to be to me. But uh, it's a revolution going on around us. But to me, there's still always going to be a need, and for me, it's insatiable, a need for story in my life, a need to read stories, a need to know people through stories, know people through books and the genius of writers. It excited me when I was a young boy. It excites me even more now. I have loved reading since my mother first read me Gone in the Wind when I was a boy of five, and my father was in Korea. And my mother taught me to love to read. And I did that as reverently, and as frequently, and as passionately as I could. Because when I write, the one thing I always want to maintain is the great soaring passion that I have for the English language, that I have for the South, uh, that I have for the human race. I want that always up there, in front, forward, and I want to respect that language, caress that language, love that language, and love the readers, like you, who read that language. Thank you very much. Mr. Conroy is going to answer a few questions, and then it will be followed by uh, a, the book signing outside. And so we will start with that, and then for those of you who can't get enough of him, and I'll bet that would be everyone here, he will be back again here tomorrow at 12 o'clock.
Thank you. Well, Pat, you know I had to test the microphone first to see if it was working, and it is. So who would like to come and ask Pat a question? Before, I, before you ask me a question, the preacher up here in the book, I'm reading, has made a note. <laughs> and it says, Girl Scout Cookies. <laughs> yes, ma'am. I just want to say thank you. I'm one of six kids, grown up Catholic. I'm actually a cookbook author, but I want, I moved to Los Angeles to become a sitcom writer, but I want to say you're so inspiring. So just thank you. Okay. Thank you. to know that the charm that you found in Buford, do you still find it today, or do you still find the charm in the South that you uh, have talked about? I adore it. I can't help it. I simply adore it when we drove into the city when I was a 15-year-old boy. I fell in love with the low country. I hope my book reflects that. Uh, I, I, I bought the whole package. And my wife and I just moved into town from Trip Island. We have a house that we adore. It's on Battery Creek. We look across the river into the marsh. And we could not be happy. And I just feel so I didn't have a I didn't have a home growing up. You know, we moved every year. I went to eleven schools. But before I got to Buford at fifteen. We had twenty three addresses before I got to Buford at fifteen. So I was looking for a home. And my mother said when we drove into town, she said, I said, Mom, I'm 15 years old. I've never danced with a girl. She said, there's plenty of time for all that, plenty of time. And I said, you know, are we going to move next year too? It was my third grade, straight high school. And I was just hated moving. And she said, we're going to be here two years. And why don't you make you for your home, son? You have that right. Your father earned it for you. Poor Buford. <laughs> I glommed onto that poor town like a barnacle. <laughs> and it's got me so badly that a guidebook came out about 10 years ago where neighbors in the point remember me driving around on my tricycle um, when I was a little boy. And it's completely false. I and mean, people call me a native. It's, you know, I certainly am not, but I would love to be. Thank you, ma'am. How are you doing? I'm good. I'm a retired English teacher. Thank you for loving English. Two questions. First, some of your prose reads like poetry. It is especially Prince of Tides. It's truly a masterpiece. Have you written poetry? And the second question is, your novels always have um, a strain of darkness through them. Can you speak to that and uh, perhaps give us the background to that? Thank you. When you read my new one, <laughs> it is, um, no, it's, you know, my family was a very troubled one. And the book I'm writing right now is called The Death of Santine. Because my father was the only one he hated Great Santine. And he wanted to prove I was a liar for the rest of his life. And he proved it. My father, whom I hated growing up. Uh, and I told him that a million times. He was the cruelest man I've ever seen. But he changed. He changed because of a novel I wrote. And he became a terrific guy and a wonderful man. And I think that's because he could not stand that portrait of him. So I'm going to tell about the change in this new book. But that means I also have to tell about the darkness that came before. And there was a lot of it. And you know, I had a brother commit suicide, and a sister who had been crazy her entire life. Uh, there, there was damage in this household my parents formed. 
And that damage, you know, sometimes makes appearance with all my books. And you get, you get to read that as much as you can. Any other questions you can ask? Then I will bid you good night. <laughs> Don't need to do that again. Don't need to do that. I've had enough. <laughs>